Okay, so we should now should be broadcasting to all attendees. We'll give folks a minute or two to log on uh, and, and get situated before we get started. So are the comments still enabled? Yes, uh, folks can write in the chat and uh, I'll facilitate the question and answer period at the okay. end. Okay, so uh, it should I should wait till the end. Question. Yeah, I, I suppose. Yeah, we usually wait for the end. If if I'll, I can monitor the chat for you, if folks okay. want to type in quick clarification questions. Yeah, that would be great. I can I can I can interject if. Okay, and I also had uh, just a section where I was going to ask the um the audience for their their thoughts, and so maybe they can put it in the chat, but or I can just skip it. <laughs> we can just do it at the end. Yeah, I think the, the chat is a possibility. Okay. Um. Oh, I see a first chat already. Oh, great. Can I stay for everything? Unfortunately, will the recording be available? Yes, uh, Christopher, we, we are recording, so you should be able to catch up what you miss, what you miss later on. Okay, uh, let's see what we're doing here. All right, we'll wait about another minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, that sounds good. And then who all is going to be in the audience today? Do you know? Yeah, so uh, typically it's uh, a combination of our School of Education graduate students, PhD students and faculty. Um, that usually makes up the bulk of it. Perfect. Uh, let's see here. Yes, and uh, Daniel's chiming in, and folks who just see oh, it in the awesome. email announcements and uh, are curious to hear. So thanks for stopping okay. by, Daniel. Yeah, yeah actually, I know Daniel. Thank you for coming. I'm um I have the chat, so I'm just gonna put it in the corner so that I can see it. If anyone pops anything in. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, I think we should, folks. Or you can let me know if there's something. Uh, either way, either way. Okay. Um, I think uh, we can get started. Folks might still trickle in, but uh, just to keep to time, I think it's probably yeah. best to get started. So thank you everyone who's who's been able to join us. Uh, we're very excited to, hey, to excited today to have Natasha Buswell uh, join us and uh, give give a talk about her research. Um, she studies undergraduate uh, education and um, with the goal of diversifying the, the STEM workforce through inclusive education practices. And so she's gonna share about a little bit of her research today on, on how she's doing that. Um, she's an assistant professor of teaching in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department at UC Irvine. Uh, and her talk today is titled Revealing Problematic Notions of Teaching Using Document Elicitation. So um, without further ado, Natasha, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us today and uh, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to be here and really wish I could see you all in person. I think that it will happen again <laughs> one day, but for now, hopefully you're all somewhere cozy, maybe with a cup of tea or some chocolate. I'm, I'm just going to pretend that that's what's happening on everyone's personal <laughs> where they are right now. But um, I'm really excited to share this research with you all and hope that you find it interesting and that we can have a nice discussion about it at the end. Um, uh, how do I do this? Ooh, okay, I can't advance my slides with the arrow button. Okay, here we go. I'll just use the, the clicker. Okay, so I just want to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I know a lot of people in the School of Education, but I don't know everyone. And there's also some other people out there. Thank you for coming. So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. So I did my PhD at Purdue University in their School of Engineering Education. And so I really and both in education and engineering and really enjoy educational research. So that's what I focus on. Sometimes I focus on engineers, but not always. Um,
Uh-oh, seems we've had a freeze. Let's see here. Uh, our folks, I'm trying to determine whether I'm frozen or whether Natasha's frozen. Our folks in the chat. Oh, okay, I think that might answer it. Yeah, okay. So unfortunately, I think her connection may have dropped. We will just have to stand by until she's able to hop back on. That is, uh, that is unfortunate. Uh, is everybody excited for... Uh, a little holiday break later this week. Oh, there she is. Hi, Natasha. I'm so sorry. No okay. worries. It's we've all been accustomed to the internet drop, so it's become a normal part of our lives at this point. Yeah, that's oh, okay. Um, all right. Well, then, am I still sharing my screen? I don't think so. Nope. Nope. You gotta you gotta share again. I think. Okay. Okay. Are we good to go? Keep going. Yep. Okay. Awesome. All right. I don't know where I cut off, but I think I had moved on to that. I went to Syracuse University and that I've had very interesting mascots in my, my academic life. Um, an orange and then a boiler maker, which is a train at Purdue and now an anteater, although that one is my favorite, to be honest. Um, I studied aerospace engineering because of the movie Apollo 13. That was really the, <laughs> the reason I studied it. I saw that movie and wanted to be a part of that. I didn't I didn't really notice that there were no women or anyone other than white men in engineering at the time, but it's just been something that's been much more apparent in my life as, been, as I've been moving through academia and um, has now become part of my research interest as well as how can we really make engineering more inclusive and also other fields, um, especially. A little bit about me though, because I want you all to know that I'm a person in addition to the researcher and teacher that I am. This is me with my husband, Jeff. This is um, in Katmai National Park um, with some brown bears behind us. If you can see them there in the background. We love traveling to the national parks and we're trying to go to all of them. So we've gotten to 45 already. So we're that's just a, a life goal for us, for us, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then we just recently had Halloween, which was a really fun time for our family. We just um, had a baby girl in May. And then our dog Kona was Elmo. So Zoe is my, da my daughter's name and she is Zoe from Sesame Street. If you didn't know there was a Zoe character, which we thought was very fitting for her. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about me. I also wanna make sure I introduce my collaborator on this work. This is Catherine Burdanier. She's a professor of mechanical engineering at Penn State. University and um, has just been a great collaborator on this work. And so I just want to acknowledge her. She and I did this work together in collaboration over Zoom and everything. And so um, now more than ever, we're recognizing how wonderful it is that we can do that across time zones and distance. So the reason I do this research and the one that, that I'll share a little bit more with you today is that teaching quality is of concern in higher education. And so this has been found by numerous reports that there's there's some issues with teaching quality. People leave engineering and other STEM fields because of poor teaching quality in some cases. It can be non-inclusive to students. All these things we know um, are going on. And so if that's a problem, what are some ways that we might address it? And the other thing is that even though we know that there are ways to make teaching more inclusive and improve the, um, the effectiveness of teaching, there, there's been lots of ways that that have been have been shown to be to occur. Um, we're moving kind of at a turtle's pace, right? So we're trying to move towards this more collaborative learning model, potentially in, invite the students to, into active learning um, and those kinds of approaches. And we're, there's just the adoption of those methods is still taking some time. And so I was interested in, well, how are people learning about teaching? What's their pathways towards teaching? What if people wanted to focus on teaching um, how does the community kind of support that or potentially not support that? And so 
I really felt that it was important that we learn more about junior professors teaching conceptions and methods. And so if we learn about people in the earlier parts in their graduate school careers and early career um, as faculty members, we might be able to learn more about how can we introduce some more active learning teaching methods that are shown to be effective um, to people. And so we know that there's kind of this spectrum of teaching from transmitting knowledge to students all the way to facilitating students construction of knowledge. And it doesn't have to be at either full end, there's really a spectrum, a broad range of what, what kinds of teaching people do. But we wanted to know more about how are people describing these? How do we potentially move maybe towards more inclusive practices? Um, but as many of you know, faculty are under a lot of demands on their time. And um, so they <laughs> might not be able to dedicate time towards teaching um, or read about effective methods, implement those into their classroom. They can be time consuming. And so I'm interested in this just the institutional support surrounding or surrounding that. Um, and then another thing that happens is that we all have conceptions of teaching that we learn from our own experiences. And so going through education um, and going through college, we see how teaching is how teaching is done. And if we're not actively trained in some way, we may never really change that. And so anytime you might learn something new about teaching, it has to fit into your schema, your framework that you hold in your brain about, okay, teaching is um, to do these things. It's to transmit knowledge. If, it, that, if that's a fundamental belief I hold, then that's going to affect my teaching. And so every time new knowledge comes in, it's going to be something I have to think about. Well, does that fit in my framework or not? Is my previous thought on this incorrect or is it accurate? And so this idea of assimilating knowledge um, is really important. And so the research question that I wanted to explore was, in what ways do assistant professors of engineering conceptualize their roles and decisions towards teaching decisions? And this frame, frame, framework of cognitive dissonance is how I explore this in the work. And so I kind of described it a little bit. It's this idea of if something doesn't fit in your framework, what do you do with that information? Do you assimilate it? Do you include it? Um, does it fit in with what you already thought? Or are you going to adjust what you thought about teaching? So the way that I did this, so I was the one that conducted these interviews and then I did the analysis with my collaborator, um, Catherine, and we conducted, or I conducted ethnographic interviews with 12 participants. And so ethnographic interviews are just a style of interviewing. So I was not doing an ethnography, but I was making sure that the participants that I was interviewing um, really got to tell their story, how it mattered to them. So really broad, open-ended questions about teaching, um, and the important part, though, is that I use something called document elicitation. So I asked them to, to share with me and then during the interview to look at their course syllabus, just one, they could pick which one they wanted, and also the statement of teaching philosophy that they either use when they apply to their job or if they had an updated one, they could bring that. And I interviewed people at four different institution types. And so these are all non-R1 institutions, baccalaureate institutions, master's institutions, doctoral university with moderate research activity and with higher research activity. So those we kind of know as R3 and R2. Um, another thing that was required to participate in my study was having received your PhD at an R1 institution. So other analysis of this research data has been to look at this transition from R1 like culture to non R1. What was that like, especially as graduate students? Um, and then this research is now looking at what are their teaching conceptions in particular. And so just keeping in mind that these people have more teaching responsibilities in some cases. For some people, it's a lot more teaching responsibilities, very low research expectations. And some people even had higher research expectations. Um, but just as like a, a little bit of background on the results of that was that of the research looking at the institutional types is that it really was very dependent on a particular institution, what sort of culture they might have around teaching. So a baccalaureate institution is not necessarily like teaching matters to everyone way more or an R2 institution, like it really varied. Some baccalaureate institutions have a lot of teaching or research expectations. So those are the, the um, contexts in which these people were. So they were all new junior faculty members in engineering in assistant professor roles. Um, and I interviewed them with these two documents. And so from that, using the interview transcripts as the data source, we developed a code book to categorize these teaching conceptions. And we had eight themes. And I'll go through all of these themes in more detail just to kind of introduce them. Um, but these are ideas about what is teaching. So people said that teaching um, is that with the knowledge that learning occurs through community, 
Teaching is to be open, available, and fair. Teaching is to prepare students for the real world and industry. Teaching is to motivate students to learn. Teaching is to be adaptive. Assessment is a learning opportunity. And then there was another code that we used for teaching philosophies whenever anyone described kind of a higher level belief. And then this really interesting theme came out that we called problematic notions. Um, and I'm gonna go into more detail on that after I introduce the rest of the themes here in a bit. But that was something that we were excited about and can see a lot of use in being able to kind of uncover those. We were also interested just to see, you know, what themes had the most, um, were most prevalent for people. And so we did this through a weighted average approach. And so we looked at the average for everyone. I don't know if you can see my, my cursor. Um, okay. And so we looked at the average for everyone in terms of number of codes throughout their whole interview. So this person had five of each code on average throughout the whole interview, this participant one. Um, and then anything above five was, was, um, was coded in green here on this table. So we can see this person, their most dominant theme was this teaching is to be open, available and fair. And also that learning occurs through community. And then other people had even higher numbers. This person, they um, had teaching is to be adaptive as their most dominant theme. And lots of people talked about teaching philosophies quite extensively. Um, and then we didn't wanna include problematic notions for everyone. so. Even if there were zeros here, that was actually a good thing. So we didn't want to code those as pink. And so we noticed though that only five people had problematic notions that we coded for, but um, three of them, those were dominant themes in their interviews. That was really an interesting finding to see how did this all balance out. A lot of the codes um, were covered by everyone. So there were only a handful of codes that no, some people didn't talk about at all. So that's just an overview of how did people generally talk about these. So now I'll walk through each of the findings, um, each of the codes and give an example quotation. So the first one is this idea of learning occurs through community. So this description was described by all but one participant. In many cases, the participants described supplementing their lectures with activities, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't just lecturing, but it was also some sort of active learning was important because they said, you know, I want my students to talk to each other. This is an important component. Um, and then sometimes they described even ex more extensive team-based activities, so maybe even projects that were team-based or having to present in class or lead discussions. And so an example quotation here is from a participant named Christopher. He said, the second point is trying to encourage students to have a more collaborative learning experience, but also collaborative in the right way. I want students to talk to each other about homework. I want students to talk to each other about how to do the labs, that sort of thing, because I feel a lot of great learning can happen from peer interaction. But at the same time, I wanna make sure that you don't just have any hangers on who essentially are copying someone else's work and not getting any of the benefits. This person was being really intentional about how they created this a community of learning and that it was beneficial for the, the students. The next one was one of the most common um, uh, themes that came up was teaching is to be able, is to be open, available and fair. This was also described by all but one participant it meant that having, it was really important to these participants to have a very clear um, syllabus with the expectations and objectives laid out very clearly. Um, sometimes this resulted in choosing a free textbook that was for some of the participants really important because they wanted to make sure that that wasn't something the students needed to take on. And then they also described that it was really essential to them to create an open and inclusive learning environment. And so this was one that was described by a lot of people. Um, here is an example from Opie. A syllabus is a contract, right? And so I wanted to lay out what expectations are, both for what they should expect me to do and what I expect them to do. So we were very clear right up front. So then all semester, if something comes up, I can go, look, you're supposed to be doing this and I'm supposed to be doing this. And so this participant had really clear expectations for himself as the instructor and for the students in terms of how were they gonna succeed in the class, how to reach him if they had questions and those kinds of things. The next theme was teaching us to prepare students for the real world and industry. This might be a little bit more specific to engineering. That's something I need to explore a little bit more in depth, but this came up for a lot of participants. Like this is the main thing we're doing. We're preparing these students to be engineers. And so that is in all my assignments, that's in the projects I assign and that kind of thing. So 10 of the 12 participants described this theme. They wanted to present real world examples to their students um, and mimicking things that they might do on the job. 
So this person, Molly said, they're just used to solving everything, getting an answer and saying, this is my answer, but not realizing that I can actually do something to check and make sure that my answer is right before I turn it in. And trying that, to get them to understand that because in the real world, you don't have people grading you necessarily. You need to be able to do it yourself as best you can. So I give them the tools that they can do that on their own. And so she was really emphasizing, you have to check your work, right? You need to make sure that you're confident in your answer, which is really cool to see that in action. Another was teaching is to be is to motivate students to learn. All participants describe this code. So I think that that's probably a good thing that teaching is to help students learn the material. Um, they described that they chose this, um, the, the idea of needing to wanting them to learn filtered back into why they assigned specific assignments and different things like that. They wanted also to make things interesting, exciting, and fun in order to address student motivation. Um, and then also selecting activities that direct students' attention and especially on assessments. And so really encouraging this growth mindset came up quite a bit. So an example from Samantha was from an assessment standpoint, all 10 quizzes covered the objectives. So I didn't wanna discount any of them. And I have found anecdotally at least that if you let students drop one, they will intentionally tank one. So I didn't want to get into that. I also did give extra credit on some of the quizzes to help make up for an off day or whatever to make up for that perspective. And so she's mentioning that every piece of the, the course was important, had important information, but she wanted to make it, she wanted to accommodate for the fact that students are humans, right? And they might have an off day. And so she built that in without saying, oh, you can just decide one of these topics isn't important. Um, and so I thought that was a unique way of doing that. Teaching is to be adaptive is another one of the themes that came up. All participants, again, describe this code. Um, they describe needing to make accommodations as necessary. So that really came up with anything related to students that had disabilities that needed extra time on exams, things like that. They found that to be really important, included that um, in their syllabus and teaching philosophies. Um, and then use even things like using evidence-based teaching practices, such as a flipped classroom, they describe that as being adaptive, knowing, well, now we know this research exists, I'm gonna use it in my classroom. Also using technology appropriately came up and anticipating students' prior knowledge and any needs that they might have in terms of how they designed things. So Emma described, I'm not just telling them what to do. Some of the awesome feedback I got this semester was, Professor never tells us the answer and it's the best thing she does for us. Someone said that because she makes us figure it out on our own and then we remember it. That's exactly it. I don't want to tell you the answer because you're not going to remember it, but if you go and figure it out, you're going to know. So she was describing this way of really engaging with students um, and being adaptive to their needs. Assessment as a learning opportunity was another theme that we saw. It was described by all but two participants. Um, and using assessment for the purpose of giving students feedback was something that came up for many participants and keeping students accountable for their learning. Um, numerous descriptions of innovative assessment approaches came up too. So here we have a really innovative one. Matthew was actually given this really cool opportunity to work with a science museum in his city um, and design some exhibits. And so he had the students design exhibits and decided that that was assessment of it like in itself. So he said the audience of the science museum is mostly second through sixth graders. Other people also come, but it's mostly elementary school field trips that go there. And so I was thinking, you know, if my students can explain conductivity to a second grader, they shouldn't have to take a final exam. And so this was a way that he found a lot of motivation for the students to learn because they needed to explain it to, to kids in the science museum. So I thought that was a really um, exciting way and probably was very motivating to the students. Teaching philosophies, this is something that has been, ex has been studied pretty extensively in the literature. What do people believe about teaching? Um, so they talked a lot about their beliefs of teaching, what kind of environment they wanna create, and also where they got their inspiration. That was something I was actually really interested in. Where did they learn these things? Um, and how did that impact their teaching? So it also talked about some tensions that existed between the expectations and hopes they had for their teaching and then the reality that set in, like, oh, maybe that's not all possible. So Steven said, I would say that my philosophy still is the same, but the mechanics of that look a little different now, look a lot different now. And one of the reasons is that I had trouble keeping that model up for an entire class. When he says that model, he means this really engaged approach to learning about every topic. Um, had trouble keeping that model up for an entire class. You can do 10 or 15 minutes on it, 
or you can do one class or a unit on it, but the pace wasn't predictable enough. You had a pretty big curriculum to get through, especially in engineering, and we just can't spend an entire class asking ourselves what experiments were done by those early thermodynamics pioneers. We have to get on to what do we take away and how do we apply it to modern day problems. I think the team-based learning has helped with that because they get the background. And so he had to kind of make this adjustment while his ideal philosophy would be to have this really open-ended learning approach where you got to learn about the thermodynamics pioneers, but realized that the students needed some practical lessons from the class and how could he really balance that? So he used some, some peer learning. Okay, now for the really exciting part of my talk, but I wanted to give you a chance to think. So I'm wondering if anyone, um, and I think what you can do is you can just think on this on, in your own mind and then if you want, you can put it in the chat or I might just move on depending on how that works. <laughs> Cause I thought maybe people could like unmute their microphones but it sounds like that's not possible today. Um, so anyway, so think for a minute, what do you think might be a problematic notion of teaching? Okay, I'm seeing a couple comments coming in. So one person said conveying as much information as possible. So covering tons and tons of content that could be problematic. I'm um, having the thought that not all students are able to learn. So yeah, thinking, oh, maybe some people aren't, aren't able to learn. That might be a, a problematic thing that comes up. Um, cheating, unrealistic learning outcomes could also be problematic, definitely. Thank you for putting these in the chat. I appreciate it. Okay. So these are all, I, I agree. I think that these things are important to think about and reveal um, when, we're, when we're talking about teaching. How can we kind of adjust these so that they're more effective? So I'll go into some of the data here. So just reminding you all that we only had five of 12 participants that had multiple instances that we coded as problematic notions. So not everyone had this, which is probably a good thing. Um, so we really thought this problematic notion was was when we coded something where it contradicted some of the positive ex examples or best practices from the other themes. And so for example, believing that you don't need to use evidence-based practices with graduate students. So graduate students, they don't need that. They don't need any of the, the knowledge we have about how people learn. Um, we'll just go revert back to, to lecturing or, um, or just some of the, the ways that might not be extremely, extremely effective for them. Um, Something else, for example, is purposefully not being strict on, with a written syllabus policy. So having something be really vague, that could end up being a problem because some students might, might not ask for an exception if it's, if it's unclear. Purposefully not including a course schedule. So there's one person that said, oh, I don't include a course schedule because, um, because it's too unpredictable. I can't rely on that, but that could potentially be problematic for students who who need to know when is the exam going to be, or something like that. Um, using subjective accounts of attendance to bump up students' grades at the end of the term. So I actually have a quote that I'll, I'll share about that in a minute. And then something else like using evidence-based practices or jargon in a teaching statement to get the job. And so I also have a quote on this one to show why we thought this was a problem. So here we noticed that some problematic notions related to especially the teaching is to be available, open, available and fair code. And then also um, it might be a problem for inclusive practices. And so here, this quote will show you that this person uses criteria such as attendance for grading, but does not keep track of these things formally, but then still uses it as part of the grading approach. Um, this person also describes an aggressive use of cold calling, which we thought was a little problematic just because it might make students really anxious, um, might not be super conducive to their learning, and then dismissal of non-traditional teaching techniques. And so anything that was too odd 
this person didn't want to try that in his classroom. So he said, the first thing I do is I come in and count to see what my attendance looks like. I'm not taking attendance. I am sometimes looking to see if specific people are here or not, but I keep no record of it. I want to have at least a general idea of how many people are attending and how consistent the same people it is because that feeds back into my grading and how I help students who are struggling. Then I usually ask a series of diagnostic questions about the pre previous lecture's material and I get up in their faces and call on people who might not answer sometimes. If somebody can't answer the question, I'll let it hold, you know, for a while and I'll say, okay, somebody help them out. So I don't let people off the hook. I do a traditional lecture. I write on the whiteboard. I talk about concepts. I do very few videos on multimedia. I'm not showing a live Twitter stream in class. The reason here is not because those things are bad, but the classes which I teach aren't helped a whole lot by that kind of stuff. So here we see a few problems kind of coming out. So not keeping record of attendance yet, using that to determine grades um, and helping students who are struggling. So this comes back to that one point someone made in the comments about not really believing everyone can learn. So maybe if he and remembered, oh, that person doesn't come or thought that person wasn't coming, maybe that would negatively affect that student. And so that was something we thought was a problem. Then it just sounded kind of like a stressful atmosphere in this classroom of cold calling people, not letting people off the hook. Um, they're supposed to remember things, that kind of thing. And then also just dismissing these potentially useful practices as kind, that kind of stuff. I don't want to do that um, in my classroom. We also thought that attitudes towards flexibility can possibly propagate implicit biases and advantage the squeaky wheels. So the people that speak up, um, are those the only people that are getting advantages in their in their grading or in terms of getting extensions or some things like that. And so we had things about office hour policy, late work, academic integrity policies, and then building in discretion into the grading schema. Um, so here, this quote says, if I feel somebody needs a higher grade than what their exams predicted, I have the liberty to do that under the syllabus. So somewhere in their syllabus, they wrote, you know, the professor can adjust these grades, however. And um, we just thought that could potentially be a problem. Like students might think, oh, maybe I'll go bother this professor and let them know that I deserve a higher grade. It sounds like it might be um, flexible. And then this other professor said, I'm such a pushover in the middle of class because they'll come to me and be like, oh, professor, something came up. It's like, turn this one in one time, but then I forget who turned what in and I say most of the time, okay. So letting those people that, that ask for an extension, even though in the syllabus policy said that late work wasn't accepted, really advantages the people that know that they can ask for that. And anyone who's quiet and maybe doesn't want to ask the professor send that email um, will not get that same benefit. This person said, on my syllabus, I don't include office hours, partially because those will change and I don't want to update my syllabus. I don't want to update those every year. So I post office hours on my door and I just tell students to come by and see those and you can figure out when office hours are. We thought this was problematic because it was really non-inclusive. The students might think, oh, this professor doesn't have time for me. They don't want me to come ask questions. They, like, I have to go find the office first and um, figure out when office hours are. And, and it just, just might not be useful in terms of really encouraging that this professor wants their students to learn. The next one says, I did, I did have one student straight up copy an abstract out of a paper. I just gave him no points for it. I probably should have written him up or something. And the only reason why I caught it was because it was a different font size. He didn't even change the font size. He's like, I just didn't understand the paper. And I'm like, I know. So maybe because I'm just so laissez-faire about grading that I don't particularly care. So we thought this was also possibly problematic because by not really addressing these concerns formally, then it's very possible that the student is going to continue doing this in other classes and not really take to heart this idea of um, professional conduct. And so we were thinking that could potentially also be a problem. Um, this was possibly one of the most interesting findings was this description that someone had about using the right words in their teaching philosophy when they applied for the job, but not intending to enact those philosophies in the classroom. And so this is something um, we want to acknowledge this was in their teaching statement, they had said, oh, all these active learning approaches, but then said, I was trying to get the job, right? I think I can do active learning in the classroom. And when I do, I'm not doing a flipped classroom. I'm not doing any of these kinds of, well, I don't really teach, you teach me. No, I'm teaching them. But it's by getting in their face and forcing them to answer questions and not giving them the answer right away. No, I'm under time constraints. I can't let them sit and think about it for half an hour like I would like to. 
So we thought that this was really a, a problem, especially if this was the reason this person got a job, if they really believe um, these, these approaches and um, are not using them in the classroom, that kind of thing made us really question how, how can we re maybe reveal those things earlier before, um, before people are in the classroom potentially not welcoming to their students. So we thought that through document elicitation, we were able to reveal a lot of teaching conceptions really in a very generative way. So think about um, asking someone, what's your teaching philosophy, right? Like even thinking about that of, your, of yourself, that's not a really generative way of describing it. Like, oh, I believe everyone should learn or I um, believe in active learning, right? It's, it's really hard to describe, but I think that instead asking someone, um, tell me about your syllabus. Can you walk me through why do you assign, um, why are your exams worth 75% of the total grade? Or that might be really revealing in terms of what are people thinking about their teaching? And so I would just encourage you all, if you're, I have a next slide about more implications to maybe think about asking um, with these documents in place to really get at these ideas. And so as a reminder, my research question was in what ways do assistant professors of engineering conceptualize their roles and decisions towards teaching decisions? Um, and we really, we found eight different themes and thought this, this last one of document, or excuse me, of um, problematic notions was really the most exciting and had a lot of implications for possible practices. So we thought, especially using cognitive dissonance in combination with document elicitation, that we could use those for faculty development. So we were thinking about um, having a faculty development workshop of some nature and asking people to read through syllabi and seeing if there's anything that catches them off guard. Like, oh, why are they doing this very active um, team-based approach? I wanna know like, what are the benefits of that? Does that fit into my knowledge of learning and, and teaching? And should I, do I need to adjust my, my approach? And so this idea of really bringing that to the forefront, showing students, I'm mean, showing faculty and graduate students what, where some of these balances come and how to work through them. And we thought also with all the new, all the pressures of new faculty, um, we were able to really see how these enacted strategies support or deviate from their philosophies, also sometimes unknowingly. So this can be useful for also faculty development, but also when we're um, when we're hiring people to acknowledge where might they be still struggling with their teaching and where can something really get, um, where can we potentially add some support so that they can, can reduce those biases that might be impacting their, their classrooms. We also thought that document elicitation may be a really effective way for interviewing. So I was thinking it could be great for hiring, asking people rather than just presenting on which classes they might want to teach, in the department, I think a teaching demonstration is extremely useful, but if there's no time for that, then to, or in addition, asking people to either show a syllabus that they've created or asking them to react to a syllabus that we present to them. So if I presented a syllabus that had, in my opinion, a lot of things that I didn't, don't necessarily agree with, like, you know, having exams count for 100% of the, um, the course grade, would they pick up on that and say, oh, I wouldn't do that in my class. I would make sure to have other assignments or um, how would they respond to that? And I think that that could be really revealing for us as interview, as the people that are interviewing this a candidate to see um, if they have approaches to teaching that we, we think are really effective and will be inclusive. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about this work. I hope that you enjoyed hearing about it. Um, and I just want to say thank you for listening. I hope that you're all, you know, eating chocolate in celebration at the end of this, something like that. But um, I'll just pretend that you're clapping for my own <laughs> well being. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm really excited to ask, um, see if anyone has any questions. Yeah, thank you so you? much, Natasha. That yeah. was um, so we'll give uh, folks in the audience a minute or two to formulate their thoughts. And um, perfect. Please use the question and answer. This is to the audience. Please use the question and answer function to cool. drop in any questions you have, uh, and I'll facilitate the the uh, question and answer in that way. So yeah, let's just take a minute, and uh, folks can write out any questions they have.
Okay, so we have our first uh, question here uh, from Goran, who says, do you think it would be different for people at R1 institutions? I also wondered about that. Uh, why, how, why not include R1s? Have we just totally given up on R1 faculty? No. <laughs> I had not given up on R1 faculty. So one of the main parts of this research was to understand the, the pathways that non R1 faculty were taking um, from an R1 institution to non R1. And so this, this data was included and I wanted to research, or I wanted to analyze it. And so that's why they're not included in this data set, but I definitely think they need to be. And I've done some research on non R1 or on R1 faculty as well. Um, I don't think it would be terribly different for R1. The piece that I think would be really interesting to really focus on in R1 is just the institutional culture around teaching. So that was something that came up in the different institution types was that some institution types, even if they were more research focused, had a really wonderful teaching culture and encouraged their their faculty to spend a ton of time on teaching um, and rewarded the effort put into that. And then there were some institutions that, you know, are potentially labeled as teaching focused and yet didn't provide that support and had really intense um, expectations around research. And so in general, our idea about R1 institutions is it's so research focused, right? But I don't think that that's necessarily true for all R1s. And so I think that that does need extra um, kind of parsing out, but I would anticipate that that people would feel, and the reason I feel I would anticipate this is from other research that I've done looking at teaching focused faculty at R1 institutions, where there's just a really big, um, the culture is really to focus a lot on your research and not spend a bunch of time on teaching. And so I think that that would be even more prevalent at many R1s, but, um, but I think a lot of the fundamental ideas about teaching would be the same. I think that most people have the, the teaching conceptions that we described, as I showed you, almost everyone had those. I didn't show the prevalence based on institution type, but it didn't it didn't track in any specific way. Um, and so I imagine those all exist. But then the piece that I think would be really interesting is the implementation. Um, how are people putting those into practice? Where are those challenges um, potentially getting that to actually be implemented? But great question. Thank you. Great, and we have another question here from Jessica. Uh, at what level were these faculty and were they all tenured? And do you think that help or hurts the cognitive dissonance? So they were all untenured. Um, part of the criteria to be in the um, in my research, like a participant was that you had to be in the first three years of your position. So I wanted them to be really early in their position. Um, and I think that there, this is an interesting part. I really wanted them to be early on because it, they weren't so far removed from grad school or even potentially being students in a classroom. And so they still had that remind, re they were able to remember what was it like to be in a classroom? Was that useful for me um, or not? And then that came up a lot in the conversation, like, oh, this was how I learned. And so that's why I use that. Or I know this is how I learned and I don't think that's the best. So I'm using these other ways. And so, um, I thought having them be early, they're, they were more open a lot of times to trying new things. Um, but I think it would be really interesting to try this, do some of this research with more senior faculty and learning about um, how set in the, their ways potentially. And also if tenured faculty maybe even have less incentive to try some adjustments in their teaching, that would be really important to look at. Yeah, I, was, I had a, a similar thought about, especially with pursuing um, problematic uh, thoughts or notions that, mm -hmm. that uh, maybe that by interviewing the newest people, you'll get the, the rosiest colored glasses. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, we didn't expect to really see this problematic notion stuff come up. And so I think it will be even more like I might go looking for that in particular um, in future work. Great. Okay, so we have another question from Goran, who says, did all the profession, uh, professors teach only engineering or were there some of them also teaching physics or math for engineering students? Um, so I, I would have to go back and look at the course syllabi in specifically, but I think they were all teaching engineering classes. Um, yeah, so it, but it was all over the place. So I had some people that were in aerospace engineering, some in civil, some in mechanical. So they were um, in all different types of engineering. And also, uh, did their courses, did their course loads vary and what was typical? Also a question. Yeah, that is a good question. So it did, they varied quite a bit. 
Um, so generally at baccalaureate institutions, they had probably around three or four courses per quarter or semester that they were teaching. Um, but then some people that I interviewed only had one or two per quarter or semester. Um, and so it, it was pretty all over the place, but um, everyone that I interviewed was teaching every term. So it was, it was a fundamental part of their, their work. Yeah, and we have uh, from Daniel in the chat says, thank you for the talk. Um, the interview approach proves useful to elicit these types of responses. Now, if only search committees can utilize these, uh, like teaching samples, et cetera, during interviews, um, what are your thoughts on the barriers to uh, implementing these kinds of practices? I'm not familiar with a lot of places that, or at least I should say I didn't submit syllabi. Yeah. I, for jobs. I don't know how common that is, but Maybe. Yeah, I don't think it's very common at all. I know it's getting to be more common to require teaching demonstrations of some sort. I hear a lot like, oh, but we can kind of see how they teach during their research presentation. And I'm always like, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but so I think it starts, uh, there's a mixture, I think sort of in like the grassroots approach. Um, it just in small departments, like in my department, I was on a faculty search committee and I said that this was important to me to have a teaching demonstration. And so we had just a really small, short time for them to do that. Um, and I think it's becoming more common just to, so yeah, so I think in those ways it could happen, but potentially pushing it through, um, there's a lot of expectations in terms of the equity expectations as we're looking at faculty candidates that are applying um, and really maybe talking with equity advisors that are giving those presentations to say, we want to make sure that their teaching is equitable um, and using practices that are helpful for all types of students. And so that would be potentially a way of kind of getting it to be more broadly adopted. Um, but the, the idea of having people use their, bring in a syllabus I haven't proposed that yet. I hadn't finished this research yet to, to really show how useful it was. Um, and so I, I hope that maybe I could start in my department with that. But um, if anyone has any ideas of how we could adjust the, the faculty hiring process, that would be great. <laughs> um, okay, the next question is from Jessica. Uh, she says, how did you define problematic perceptions? Is there literature on this topic or did you pull these ideas from counters, uh, counters to positive perceptions? Yeah, so the way that we defined it was just something that came that was basically contradictory to one of the other themes. And so if they said something like, oh, my, my goal is to be fair, but then they said something like, but I let people turn in things late if they ask me, even though it says they're not allowed to in the syllabus. That was something where we were thinking, well, that's that doesn't necessarily align um, and could be potentially inequitable or unfair. And so that was how we were looking at it. Um, I would need to do a, a more looking in the literature to see if there are additional concerns of how people are teaching that could potentially have harm on the students. But I'm, I'm really interested in looking into this in more detail. Great. And uh, another question from Goran, uh, uh, he wants to know, uh, since they came from R1 institutions, did they all know they were going to non-R1s to teach, or was that a second choice after they realized they would not land an R1 job? Yeah, that's a great question. So this was a really big part of the research and the reason I conducted the interviews um, was that I wanted to understand, so just a little bit more about my pathway was that I pursued my PhD because I wanted the credential because I knew you needed a PhD to teach at the college level. I wanted to teach. That was the main thing I wanted to do. And then I started realizing that a lot of other people didn't have that same motivation for pursuing a PhD. And it really made me think there must be other people that are really interested in the teaching and yet are also um, kind of baffled by this idea that teaching is like, I, you know, was told, oh, don't, don't waste your time teaching, right? And those kinds of things. Um, and so I was looking to see, is that true for people that pursue more teaching focused positions? And I think it was everyone but one person said they pursued this non-R1 institution completely intentionally. They wanted to be somewhere that had a higher teaching load and um, a more teaching focused culture. And so that was, it was not a second choice. It wasn't like, oh no, I can't get an R1 job, I'll get this one. In fact, one person, 
I'm remembering in particular this one person that had an offer from an R1 as well and was really conflicted, you know, was in tears trying to decide because his advisor wanted him to take this R1 job, but he really wanted to go to this master's institution to, to teach. And, and just there was a lot of emotion in this idea that, that the only successful pathway was to go to an R1 position. Um, but, but yeah, so the vast majority of the participants that I interviewed did in fact want to be at a non R1 institution, which was, which was something I thought was really interesting and kind of validated for, for me. I was like, oh yeah, okay, this isn't just, I'm not the only person that feels this way. But then it made me really think that that's not really supported in our graduate culture. And that, so that's another piece um, from other analysis of this, of this data that I really want to address of, um, we have such a prevalent culture like in engineering that, you know, the only options really are to get an R1 institution, you should be super dedicated to your research. Teaching is just if you have to do it. Um, and that really can be a harmful message for some graduate students. So having, um, and faculty. So having ways for students to succeed if that's their goal. Um, I think that something that comes up quite a bit is I, I like will hear people say that they assume that all their PhD students want to be faculty. And I am always like, really, do you, did you ask them? Because in engineering, and I think this is pretty common in other disciplines as well, over 80% of PhDs in engineering go into industry. And so um, it's really not a useful assumption to think that everyone wants to be a faculty member and gear everything towards succeeding in that pathway. So that was a long answer, but I have lots of thoughts on it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so I have a question. I think a, a disclaimer here, I'm probably going to reveal some problematic teaching perceptions, oh, okay. on my own, uh, but at, for, the, for the sake of good conversation, I think it's okay. Um, so I kind of resonated with some of those teachers who uh, talked about um, being lenient to, to folks who, who come and reach out and uh, probably, and I also resonated with the fact that it's like, oh, I'm just kind of a pushover and, you know, yeah. but I feel like uh, so I can I can relate to that, and I feel like oftentimes I will justify it to myself by by thinking things like, you know, it's it's a life lesson. Like if you reach out and put yourself out there and ask for things, like sometimes you get them. And uh, yeah. I feel like that's a a skill that students should learn. Um, but yeah. I totally agree with your points about um, that. That's not really fair to all students. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what your thoughts sorry. are. Yeah. Yeah, my thoughts on that, um, I totally agree. I also want to make accommodations for students if they have something come up, right? Like that's a really normal thing. And I think shows compassion. I think the only thing that I would recommend is to just let students know that, right? Say one of the life skills I envision you, you um, getting by being a student in my class is learning to ask for things when you need them, right? And so saying, like making it just clear that every Everyone is welcome to ask if they have a question about their grade, um, if they need an extension to like, if they have a legitimate reason for needing that extension, just really making it clear that you welcome people to ask you so that it's not something like that, what would happen, especially for first generation students, they don't know always that they're allowed to go ask their professors in some cultures, um, questioning what the the professor said in terms of a grade is really looked down upon like you're not supposed to question someone in a, an authority position and so i would just say like keep that compassion with you saying like oh sometimes students need that and it's a good thing for them to learn to speak up if they think there's something wrong with their grade but just make sure that everyone knows that they have that option that would be what i would say that's really helpful thank you okay good <laughs> yeah uh so uh, we can we can give it another minute to see if any less uh, less questions pop up. But right now, I think we've addressed all of them. Um, I'll also note that uh, Christopher Stillwell uh, put in the chat that he'd love to see your slides if you're willing oh, to share. Of So yeah, maybe, maybe you to. can reach out to Natasha uh, via email, and, and maybe she can share that with you. Yeah, um, I can I can share my email. Um, I don't know. I didn't put it on my slides. That's too bad. Um, it's nbuswell at uci.edu. Maybe you can uh, we can drop it in the chat actually. Oh, here, yeah, I'll put it here. But please reach out. I love getting comments and feedback and to talk about this with anyone. 
Great. Yeah. Well, uh, again, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing with us, Natasha. That was a wonderful yeah. time. And, um, I know attendance was a little bit smaller than we expected, probably to do with the holiday week, but we are uh, recording. So I imagine folks will, will log on and um, we'll let them know to reach out to you directly. If, okay, if please do. Yes. Awesome. And then I can also send the slides to you if you have, I don't know if you send it out to anyone, but I'd be happy to share them. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, that'd be wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Have a great week. Thank you for spending an hour with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. See ya. Okay. Bye.